day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium, to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. May God bless his word to his people, and may we be encouraged by it. Well, here again is Paul, or Paul and Barnabas um, finishing up their first missionary journey. They were sent out in the beginning of Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit setting them apart for missionary activity, the church then praying over them and singing them out. They've, they've traveled around uh, the countryside, gone into various uh, towns and cities, and now they are returning back to Antioch at the end of chapter 14 to tell all that God had done with them. And what had God done with them? Well, he had brought many people to salvation, and he had planted new churches. And that's what we see there in verse 23, when we are told that when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This was a church planting movement that Paul and Barnabas were a part of, and what a journey it has been. Opposition, persecution. I mean, how, how do you share the message of Christ when you know that the faith that you are calling people to will bring persecution, not prosperity? I mean, how do you plant churches? When you know that those very congregations that you're calling them to join together in are going to be facing oppression. Imagine what it must have been like to be with Paul and Barnabas. What would it be like to hear them evangelizing the crowds? What if you were there working with them? How would you have approached this experience, these scenes? What if you were tasked with helping them? They've done the work of of preaching the message, evangelization has happened, people have come to faith, but now your job is to help gather these people into these brand new churches, brand new believers into brand new churches. How do you do it? How would you talk to them about what it means to be a believer, what it means to be a part of the church of God? And there are multiple churches, and so... What if you had to try to pitch your church and say, how about coming and joining mine? What would you do? And we know what most churches in the States do today, right? We tell everyone that we are a church that has relevant messages. Uh, we have up-to-date music. We have a cool, casual, fun atmosphere and even fun for the kids. I mean, the world we live in seems like such a different world world than the world in which the apostles were operating. But is it? I mean, here we are in modern day U.S. and we're accustomed to not suffering for our faith. And so when we hear stories of persecution and, and oppression, it, it feels like that is a, a bygone era. The, the stories of legends, but we need to realize and remember that we live in the same world that the apostles lived in. It's the same world. We've got the same struggle for faith and faithfulness. We strive against the same opposition that has the same objectives and uses the same methods. We're still in the same world. And if we ever doubt it, we just need to look at what goes on around our world. Again, as we have been doing week to week. But let me share with you something. This is an interview 
that took place in China. A Christian man from the United States talking to Chinese believers who are a part of underground churches there, meaning secret churches, meeting in secret, because they know that if they get found, then they will be in prison. And so the person asked them, and this is the, the, the interviewer speaking, I asked them how they had become evangelists and church planters, because that's who he's talking to, a group of evangelists and church planters of this church. They told me, oh, it's just common sense. Well, what do you mean, I asked. Well, once churches are planted, the leaders are often imprisoned, they explained. When those leaders are away, other people begin to lead. Sometimes those leaders are taken into prison too. Every time, though, others rise up to take their place, and we simply do what we have been trained to do. We take God's word and we share it. When people receive the message, new churches are started. This seems to be the way that God grows his church. He says, I was astounded by the clarity and simplicity of the strategy and their commitment to it. I asked whether, when and how the oppressed could truly threaten a totalitarian oppressor. This is why they're being persecuted, because the government feels threatened by them. They offered this scenario in response. The security police regularly harass a believer who owns the property where a house church meets. The police say, you have, to go, you have got to stop these meetings. If you do not stop these meetings, we will confiscate your house and we will throw you out into the street. Then the property owner will probably respond, do you want my house? Do you want my farm? Well, if you do, then you need to talk to Jesus because I gave my property to him. The security police will not know what to make of that answer. So they will say, we don't have any way to get to Jesus, but we can certainly get to you. When we take your property, you and your family will have nowhere to live. And the house church believers will declare, then we will be free to trust God for shelter as well as for our daily bread. If you keep this up, we will beat you, the persecutors will tell them. Then we will be free to trust Jesus for healing, the believers will respond. Then we will put you in prison, the police will threaten. By now, the believer's response is almost predictable, he writes. Then we will be free to preach the good news of Jesus to the captives, to set them free. We will plant churches in prison. If you try to do that, we will kill you. The frustrated authorities will bow. And with utter consistency, the house church believers will reply, then we will be free to go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. Different world? Sounds like the same world I'm reading about right here. And it's the same world that you and I live in. The enemy of the Chinese church is the same enemy that we have. Now, our context is different. The strategies that the enemy uses may be different. But the enemy's objectives are the same. And our response and our defense and armament for battle is the same as theirs. Ephesians 6, 16 through 17, Paul writes, In all circumstances, all circumstances, that means Circumstances within the Chinese church, circumstances within the American church, circumstances within the church in Iconium. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 14, which seems like it is worlds away from our own, and yet it's the same world, and we've got much to learn from them. So let's look at Acts chapter 14. So verse 1 tells us, they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. How did they speak? 
Well, we see, verse 3, they, the, they spoke the word of the Lord's grace. Verse 7, they continued to preach the gospel. So we know that the content of what they spoke was the message of God's grace, the hope that could be theirs through the gospel. But the way in which they spoke it matched their audience. And this is something we've talked about before, but here it is, a great example for us right here in chapter 14. So we saw in chapter 13 where Paul, the first stop they made was to go into the synagogue. And when they went there, they immediately went to the Word and began working through the Old Testament, showing them about God's promises and His faithfulness. And that's what Paul um, and Barnabas, we would imagine, did here in chapter 14, because their first stop, once again, was to go to the synagogue. And when they went go to the synagogue, they could presuppose that the audience they're speaking to has a familiarity with the Word of God, and they had a certain reverence for the Word of God. So they could make their go directly to the Word of God and make their appeals from it, saying, look, this is what God says. He's just simply calling you to believe, and there they make the case for Christ. But then when we get to verse 8 here in chapter 14, the scene is shifted. They're no longer in a synagogue, but they're out in the streets of Lystra, a city in which Greeks live and where they worship Greek gods. They don't know the scriptures. They don't share the same reverence. For them. They don't share the history with the Jewish people. They were not sitting around waiting for a Jewish Messiah to come. So that's not the first place Paul goes. He doesn't talk them through the history of the Jewish people, but instead he points them to something that they do know, and that is creation, the world around them. You see this in verse 15. 16, 17. We are men like nature, of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, and he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Talking to people, talking to them in a way in which he knows that they can understand. Now, just to, to set the scene, you know, here we have this situation where the Lord has healed somebody. They, this gentleman could not walk, and now he stands upright before them. And the crowds, seeing this, believe that, well, these, these men that stand before us must be gods. And so they say, Barnabas is Zeus, and Paul is Hermes, and um, I had to remind myself who Hermes was when we read this passage. His Roman equivalent was Mercury, but this is the guy with the wings on his shoes. He was the messenger of the gods, and the wings on his feet helped him to traverse uh, the heavens and the earth very quickly, and that's why Goodyear uses that winged shoe as their symbol, their logo. And that's why Paul then is called Hermes, because Paul is the one doing the majority of the speaking. So obviously he is Hermes, the messenger of the gods. And so now they want to sacrifice to them. What does Paul do? The first thing he tells them is, hey, we are not gods, but we are witnesses of the one true God. It says, you know, in the past... God has left the peoples of the earth to their ways. Now, he had given witness to the Jews, of course, through his prophets and through his word. But he had also given a witness to the peoples around the earth. That witness was through his generosity and his providential care of them. Paul here points to the rain, the harvest, the food they eat. And even the gladness they experienced in enjoying the food that they had to eat. And certainly, while Paul is not quoting verse here, he's appealing to scriptures. We see this throughout the Old Testament, where the, the people of Israel were called to consider the world around them and consider how it gave testimony to the goodness and kindness and love 
of God, but that kindness, that providential care, care fell on saint and sinner alike. And so you can hear Paul and Barnabas saying, you know, in the past, God had given witness through his creation, but now that has given away to a new witness. We are announcing good news to you. Turn from these empty things to the living God. Now, so we'll make this point again in Acts 17, but the point being here once again that we have to consider our audience when we're speaking to somebody. For some who have had an experience growing up in church, we might say, well, you know the Bible says. And we take them back to those familiar passages and, and call them to weigh them afresh. But for others who have not, we might start with the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And you start there, pointing to the creation. Now, I know that for many Christians, such a conversation can be very intimidating because we think of ourselves, well, I'm no philosopher. I don't know how to talk about you know, the creation and, and the origins of things and, and all of that. Who am I to enter into a conversation like that? I'm better off just leaving my mouth closed. But look at Paul's witness. It's so simple. He just simply says. He, gave, he did good by giving you rain from heaven. He gave you fruitful seasons. He satisfied your hearts of food and gladness. This is witness to this great God. And we can do the same. He said, look around you. Look at this magnificent creation. And we don't have to think that we've got to then wax poetic philosophically about how these all things that came to be. Because you know what? The Bible tells us that they know that they came from God. We simply have to speak the truth and trust God's word. And what does God's word tell us? Well, it tells us in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous, the unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So if anybody ever says to you, I don't believe in God, you can say, you're a liar. <laughs> the word tells me so. You believe in God, your heart gives testimony to God. It's not that you don't believe in God, it's that you're suppressing the knowledge that God has placed upon your heart. And I am here just bearing testimony to the truth of that. Look around at the world. You know full and well the God of heaven made what you behold. Now, what are you going to do with it? And I just thought of this just now, this, this conversation I had had um, with a young man. I was working while I was in seminary um, in, uh, at McDonald's, and I was a, a shift manager there, and there was this young man that they hired on as a teenager, and boy was he a punk. I mean, he, he was a real punk, and he knew that I was in seminary training to be a pastor. Am I allowed to say that? Am I allowed to say people are punks? I, I mean, he really was. So he he knew I was in seminary, and he knew I was I was studying to be a pastor. And so he would always come up and try to quote me about my faith, and he would mock me for having faith in Christ. It was it was it was nonstop. I mean, it really was a constant type of thing. And I had tried different um, ways um, uh, to to mess with him, um, and and to come back and, and try different apologetic ways of, of speaking to him, but, but nothing. There was no dent. I mean, he just would come in the next day and just, 
uh, make fun of Christians for what they believe. Well, there was one day that I was working, and he came in to get his paycheck. And I, I remember this day as clear as it can be. I'm standing on one side of the, the counter, and he walks in to get his paycheck, and it just starts right out of the gate laying into me again. Here I am giving him his, giving him his money, and he's like, ah, oh, you stupid Christian, you so in your belief in Jesus. I don't know where this was coming from except for just uh, the sinfulness of his heart. Well, I always carried in my back pocket uh, a, a small Bible. And so in this moment, I just all I did is I whipped out my Bible, and I tell you what I did. I opened to Romans chapter 1, and I read to him exactly what I just read to you, verses 18 through 23. That's all I did. I just read it, closed it up, put the Bible back in my pocket. He went dead silent around and walked out the door. A couple weeks later, I kid you not, he came in and said, Doug, I profess faith in Christ. Now, I wish that was my response. It would have been a better response. You know what I told him? I said, shut up. I am so tired of you. I'm tired of this nonsense. And I said, you know, God, you were just trying to and he's like, no, God, I swear, I really mean it. I, I'm like, I don't have time for it now. I said, not now, man. Leave me alone. So the next Sunday, Michelle and I go to church. And who do I see sitting in the pew with a Bible in his lap? And I went up and I said, what are you doing here, man? And he said, I told you I'll be here. <laughs> we just got to trust the word. We don't have to come up with fancy arguments. We don't have to have the answer to every conceivable question that people might ask. Because they typically, honestly, they don't ask them. You just take them to, to, the, uh, to the word that profess what it says and trust God to do his work. And then in either case, whether it is somebody who has, has known the word and you're walking them through it, say, reminding them, oh, um, um, you know, you're, you're walking them through the word and saying, you know, th this is a uh, reminder of what the word said. Or it is something where you're simply saying, let's start with creation. The end game is the same. It's the call to repent. And we see Paul saying that here in uh, verse 15, where he says, you should turn from these vain things. Things. This is the language of repentance. This is what we see over and over again. Turn, turn, turn. Now when he's saying it to the Jews, he's talking to them about turning from their disobedience. They're, they're ignoring, they're, they're setting aside the prophecies, the word of God. In this case, it is turn from your unbelief. Turn from the vain things that you were putting your hope in. Turn from... Now, we might be jealous of Paul when we read stories like this. Um, because in this case, we can say, well, man, you know, I, I wish I saw this type of success that, that Paul said. I'm forgetting that he was stoned and left for dead. But he, he, he had a healing happen. I mean... It, God did a work through him where this man who couldn't walk, now he's, he's walking. And, and we see that time and again through the word where God has been kind enough, to, to, to gracious enough to people to give them that type of witness and that type of help to the preacher. You know, when Jesus sent out the 70 um, to, disciples to, to preach, he said that he sent them out to proclaim the word of God and to heal. But we need to recognize that in every case, the miracles were not an end to themselves. The miracles were there to serve the word of God, to bear witness to the word of God. They were subservient to the word of God. And so we see that in Mark chapter 1, where Jesus is there and the crowds have gathered. They're wanting to be healed. He's already healed a whole group that one day, the next day, more are there. And Jesus instead says to his disciples, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. So while we may not have miracles taking place around us, we have the most important thing, 
which is the word of God. And what we see here is that even when miracles were done, it doesn't automatically end up in people coming to faith. We see here that the persecution still fell upon the body of Paul. Sure, there were some people who believed, but it was from the preaching of the word. The rest, they forgot all about the miracle. And it should not surprise us. I mean, what did Jesus say? Remember in Luke 16 and his story of the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man goes to hell. It says that he looks out, he sees Abraham in the bosom of the Lord and cries out to Abraham and begs him, will you please send somebody to go warn my family to turn to God? Would you warn them not to end up where I am? And Abraham replies, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, they've got the Bibles. Let them read what it says. And he responds, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he says to them, and this is Jesus. It's important it's Jesus telling the story. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that somebody should rise from the dead. It doesn't get any clearer than that, does it? And we need to remember that next time that we feel maybe a sense of jealousy. Or, man, if, if I only had fill in the blank, then I would have a better response. You've got Moses and the prophets. What more do you need? They're not going to hear you say that. There's nothing that you can present that is going to bring them to faith. And so we see here, while they did signs and wonders, what they did mostly was preach the word. Over and over again, they preached the word. Verse 3, verse 7, verse 18, verse 21, verse 25. They're preaching the word. Now, none of this is an argument against doing things or doing good works, let's say. Um, we're not expecting signs and wonders here. Don't, don't worry. I, I'm not going to, to promote, ever promote a healing crusade here in this church. But some people will find it miraculous that a church would care for them and help them to put food on their table. That can be a miraculous work. And the, the goal of the miraculous, the goal of signs and wonders, again, is to clear room for the word. And what, so why were they done? They were done in order to give a platform from which the word can be preached. And so when we talk about it's the word doing the work. That doesn't mean that we don't engage in signs, if you will, of God's compassion and his mercy, his providential care, the way that he can use us to serve. And then that, that miraculous work among them gives us opportunity to preach. Now, I... I I'll tell you something. I, I'm not. I'm not talked about this before, but I would love to see this church be known for its service to the special needs community. I mean, is there is there a church around here that really is intentional about saying to those who have children with autism or any other type of disability, uh, developmental disability, Down syndrome? Hey, we we are here for you, and we're going to be a support to you. And if you, if you come here, we will love you. And you don't have to be afraid to bring your, your, your children or your adult with that to, to sit here among us. And if there's a little disruption, hey, you know what? We're just happy you're here. We're, we're not going to give you dirty looks or anything like that. This is safe. I don't, I don't know that there's a church out there doing that. But I do know there's families out there longing for a church. And it would be miraculous, wouldn't it? 
It'd be miraculous to those families to have someone who was making that type of proactive, intentional reach out to them. They'd say, what a miracle! I've been praying for this! I pray the Lord will give us that. But we have to do that if we do anything like that. We do that in subservience to the Word. It's in order to serve the Word. It's in order for us then to preach the Word. Because what are we told? 1 Peter 1, 23. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. It is the word, the spirit working through the word that saves. But we have to be prepared, though. I mean, sinful man, it's the word that they reject. So Jeremiah, Jeremiah 6, 10, he's, he's lamenting this. To whom, where do you go? To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. And so the, the truth is that there will be times where we do kind deeds. We may do the miraculous, if you will. And people will be really impressed by that. And they will be really appreciative of that. And yet they will still take offense at us because of what we preach. And oftentimes that's what takes churches off guard. They think, man, we're going to go out there and we're going to serve that community and we're going to really sacrifice ourselves for their sake. And then the community says, thanks, no thanks. And churches don't know what to make of that. Well, what do you mean? And the danger is that those churches then are tempted to water down the message. And next thing you know, they focus on the deed rather than the word. And before long, that church has become nothing but a social club rather than a proclaimer of God's truth. And nobody in the church knows the word. Nobody in the church knows the Lord, but they sure do love work in the food pantry. Now, nothing against food pantry. Food pantries are great. As long as they are used in service to the word. And any church that devotes their time and energies and resources into a work to the community like that and leaves the word out, they are making a big mistake. I mean, it's fine for us as people, of course, to, to work in food pantries and things like that, um, where they may not be preaching. We may serve people that way, but, but it's the work of the church. It's the work of the proclamation of the gospel. And if it's not at the center of whatever we do, then what are we, what are we doing it for? The way that we guard our hearts from that type of slide is to read places like chapter 14 and remember and recognize that no matter what we do, we will never be loved and embraced by the majority of people, not in Andrew or any place else. I mean, here's Paul and Barnabas doing signs and wonders, and they're getting, he's getting stoned for his trouble. Healing this man, he can walk, and being driven out. And of course, this should not be a surprise to us at all, because you look through the Word, and that, that's the promise given. When Jesus said, what does it mean to follow him? His promise was, what comes, what will come to you is persecution. Exclusion, insult, rejection, you'll be arrested, you'll be brought on trial, you may have to, you'll face division within your family, you may have to make a choice among family members or Christ. You're going to have to carry your cross, Jesus said. This is what it means to follow me. He says, whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. And we see in the book of Acts, we've seen this all throughout. This is what we've seen happening. The martyrs, Stephen and James, killed for their faith. Peter and, and John imprisoned for their faith. Paul now stoned. Well, has our society outgrown that type of reaction? Well, certainly... We don't see people getting stoned or imprisoned. Um, that might be a judgment against the church, uh, the fact that that's the 
case. And I feel like um, the church in the United States has become so wedded, um, um, or let's say just watered down, and uh, uh, the message is not as clear as it could be. Uh, we pursue all types of things other than the glory of God that Satan doesn't have to do that for us. He's happy right where we're at. I mean, he, he's all busy in China persecuting believers there. He looks at America and says, man, I can just leave them alone and get the same thing done. And so we need to read and we need to see what the call is on believers and what the faith brings and the way that we prepare ourselves is by spending time in the Word and read these warnings and see the responses. And we see the responses seen them throughout Acts. Continued obedience. You know, Peter and John in Acts 4. Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you or to listen to God, you must judge, but we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. The response of having joy or having the honor of suffering for the sake of his name. Of course, we have to note that it's for the sake of his name. I know a lot of people who take great joy in suffering, um, and, uh, and they happen to be Christians, but they're not suffering because they're Christians. They're suffering because they're knuckleheads. You know, they go out and be as abrasive and ab as they can, and people uh, get angry at them and say, ah, another mark on my belt for Christ. You know, you're just being a jerk. Next time, just try to tell them the truth in, in, a, in a loving way and see, see what happens. But we need to make sure that if we're persecuted for the sake of the name, we can add to that continued boldness. We see here in Paul, we saw Paul last week pronounce judgment on those who persecuted him by wiping the dust off his feet, which may be a sign to us that we don't need to mince words if people are really seeking to do us harm. We don't roll over and play dead. Pronounce God's word, but just say, judgment falls upon those who will reject him. But I do want you to take note real quick of the interesting response of Paul and Barnabas to persecution in verses 5 and 7 through 7. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled. Sometimes the best response to persecution is to flee. We've seen Peter do that after he was freed out of jail. He went and told the brothers of all that had happened, that the angel got him out of jail. And then it says, and he took off to the next city. He wasn't hanging around to get thrown in jail again. And we're, we're so used to, to thinking about the heroes of faith. Man, they were toe-to-toe -to -toe with those who persecuted them. What, what's up with Paul? I mean, is he a wimp? No, well, he's just following with Jesus' instruction. Jesus' instruction. So Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 10, if they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. So we don't seek persecution. We need to be clear on that. We're not diving head first. Hey, come persecute me. Hey, come throw me in jail. I mean, the early church had to battle through this. Because there were some who, who, who uh, sought out persecution, thinking it made them more pious. And so we read um, in, a, in a writing called The Martyrdom of Polycarp, because Polycarp had been executed and others are going, well, then I'm going to pursue, pursue it. Well, in it, there's a story that says, and this is what the, the author wrote. Now, one named Quintus, a Phrygian, who was, but lately had come from, from Gia, when he saw the wild beasts, became afraid. So there were these wild beasts that they were going to feed the Christians to, and he saw them and he got afraid. Then they make this comment. This was the man who forced himself and some others to come forward voluntarily for trial. After many entreaties and persuaded others to swear their faith before the proconsul. So he, he, this is a guy who was telling others, let's go. Let's go, let's go give our faith openly before those who we know will do us harm. But now he sees what the harm is going to be, and he's scared. And so the author says, Wherefore, brethren, we do not commend those who give themselves up to suffering, 
in that the gospel does not teach us to do so. So just, just not avoid it. Avoid it if you can. We don't pursue persecution, but if it comes, we stand firm. And that's exactly what Paul says. Continue in the faith, he tells the church at Asia. Verse 23, 22. Through many tribulations, we must enter. knowing this, it gives us confidence. This is nothing unusual. This is what we can expect. And it is amazing to notice that Paul goes right back to the same city where he was born. But in it, he does this because he knows that God's victory is being proclaimed throughout. Through the sufferings of God's people, God is bringing about his purposes. It was the uh, stoning Stephen that led to the dispersion of the people of Christ, which led to the founding of the church in Antioch, which led to the sending of Paul and Barnabas to preach the gospel and to plant new churches. When we enjoy the free type of freedom we have, we can we receive it as if God's good graciousness to us, as a providential kindness that He's showing us. But it can lead us to complacency. It can lead us to self-protective ways, where we are tempted to bite our tongue and we ought to be speaking out boldly. But as we look at the early church, we learn that Christians can afford to Well, my house I gave to Jesus. All you're doing is enabling me to be free from these worldly things and look forward to what is mine in Christ. Do we know this? Do we know this, church? I pray that we do. And do you know this Christ? That Peter and or Paul and Barnabas have preached to us. God.